This is the second of a three-part series where I'm responding to one of the primary arguments that a Jewish counter-missionary gave me for why he thinks Messianic Jews should leave Messianic Judaism. And his argument goes like this. There are parallels between the account of Jesus and the stories of pagan gods. Therefore, Jesus did not exist. In the first video, I showed why this is a terrible argument logically. Basically, by this logic, one would have to conclude that one of the most famous rabbis in Jewish history, Rabbi Akiva, never existed. If you want to see how I made that argument, be sure to check out that video. In this video, I'm addressing the specific parallels this counter-missionary gave me, and because this came from a private conversation with him, whenever I need to refer back to this counter-missionary, I'll call him David. Okay, so David claimed that like Jesus, Osiris died and was resurrected. And also like Jesus, Dionysus had 12 disciples. And typically what happens when people make the claim that Jesus was a copy of pagan gods, they will not offer primary sources to support their claim. And that's what happened with David. He didn't show any primary sources. I could merely quote scholars showing the consensus view in academia is that there is no resurrection parallels between Jesus and the pagan deities. But instead, I'm going to show you the primary sources so you could see for yourself why Osiris' death is nothing like Jesus and Osiris did not rise from the dead and Dionysus did not have 12 disciples. I'll put the links to these primary sources in the description. So here we go. The only full account of the Osiris myth is found in Isis and Osiris, which was written in the 2nd century CE, meaning this was written after the Gospels, by the philosopher Plutarch, and this is what he says. Typhon, having secretly measured Osiris' body and having made ready a beautiful chest of corresponding size, artistically ornamented, caused it to be brought into the room where the festivity was in progress. The company was much pleased at the sight of it and admired it greatly, whereupon Typhon jestingly promised to present it to the man who should find the chest to be exactly his length when he laid down in it. They all tried it in turn, but no one fitted it. Then Osiris got into it and lay down, and those who were in the plot ran to it and slammed down the lid, which they fastened by nails from the outside and also by using molten lead. Then they carried the chest to the river and sent it on its way to the sea through the Tinetic mouth. In chapter 18, Plutarch continues the story. Typhon, who was hunting by night in the light of the moon, happened upon the chest. Recognizing the body, he divided it into 14 parts and scattered them, each in a different place. While this is a fascinating account of Osiris' death, it's clearly nothing like Jesus' death. Jesus was not put in a chest, sent down the river, or chopped into 14 pieces. He was put to death by Roman crucifixion. But what about David's claim that, like Jesus, Osiris rose from the dead? Again, let's look at the primary sources. In Plutarch's writings, o Isis and Osiris, chapter 18, this is what he says. The traditional result of Osiris' dismemberment is that there are many so-called tombs of Osiris in Egypt, for Isis held a funeral for each part when she found it. Of the parts of Osiris' body, the only one which Isis did not find was the male member. But Isis made a replica of the member to take its place and consecrated the phallus, in honor of which the Egyptians even at the present day celebrate a festival. And then in chapter 19, he says this, Later as they relate, Osiris came to Horus from the other world and exercised and trained him for the battle. There's nothing going on here that would suggest there's a resurrection. But what does this mean that Osiris came to Horus from the other world? Well, we can be sure this is not a physical resurrection because the text indicates that his corpse is still buried. Dr. Bart Ehrman says that this aspect of the Osiris myth might be compared to 1 Samuel 28, where King Saul has a witch temporarily bring Samuel back to speak to him. And Dr. Ehrman says this is not like Jesus coming back from the dead in his body. Further confirmation that Osiris' body remains in the tomb is in chapter 20 of Isis and Osiris. The text reads as follows. Not the least important suggestion is the opinion held regarding the shrines of Osiris, whose body is said to have been laid in many different places. For they say that Diochitesis, the name given to a small town on the ground that it alone contains the true tomb, and that the prosperous and influential men among the Egyptians are mostly buried in the Abydos, since it is the object of their ambition to be buried in the same ground with the body of Osiris. 
In Memphis, however, they say, the Apis is kept, being the image of the soul of Osiris, whose body also lies there. The name of the city some interpret as the haven of the good, and others as meaning properly the tomb of Osiris. So right here, we see that Osiris' body is buried. There's not a resurrection. There's another text in Plutarch's description of the myth that describes Osiris' experience as a, quote, revivification and regenesis. But even in that case, whatever this means, according to the myth, Osiris' physical body is still in the tomb. In fact, as the late Egyptologist Dr. Henry Frankfurt says, Osiris, in fact, was not a dying god at all, but a dead god. He never returned among the living. He was not liberated from the world of the dead. On the contrary, Osiris altogether belonged to the world of the dead. It was from there that he bestowed his blessings upon Egypt. He was always depicted as a mummy, a dead king. So during festivals which honored Osiris, prayers would be recited that began with the words, raise yourself. However, this did not refer to Osiris' body, it referred to grain. And the late Jewish scholar Dr. Alan Siegel, he says this, Osiris never returned to the world of the living, only the grain which was fertilized and raised by his presence did. In Dr. Bart Ehrman's book, Did Jesus Exist? He says, Osiris becomes ruler of the dead in the underworld, and so for Osiris there is no rising from the dead. This is key, and Dr. Ehrman is right. It is inaccurate to say that the Osiris myth describes his resurrection, because resurrection was a uniquely Jewish belief that involved the physical body coming back to life. So let's look at some sources that talk about this. In 2 Maccabees chapter 7, which was written between 125 and 63 BCE, it recounts the martyrdom of seven brothers who were tortured and executed by Antiochus Epiphanes because of their refusal to eat pork. In verses 22 through 23, their mother encourages them before their martyrdom that they should have hope for their resurrection. This is what she says. I do not know how you came into being in my womb. It was not I who gave you life and breath, nor I who set in order the elements within each of you. Therefore, the creator of the world, who shaped the beginning of humankind and devised the origin of all things, will in his mercy give life and breath back to you again, since you now forget yourselves for the sake of his laws. That's really powerful. The mother encourages her sons in their faithfulness to the God of Israel and God's Torah by pointing out that because God is the creator of the world, he is the source of life. God can and will breathe life back into them even after death. The brutal torture and execution of their bodies is contrasted with God's power to physically raise their bodies back to life. We also see this Jewish belief in the physical resurrection in the Sibylline oracles written about AD CE. This is what it says. But when everything is turned to dust and ashes, God himself will again form the bones and ashes of men, and he will raise up mortals again as they were before. God gives breath and life. Notice how it's not just the soul that lives, it's the physical body that lives again. And as the late Jewish scholar Dr. Pinkus Lapid says, Already at the beginning of the first century, the chief Pharisaic schools of Hillel and Shammai believed in the bodily resurrection. I think one of the most vivid descriptions of resurrection is found in Ezekiel 37. In this passage, Ezekiel has a vision of Israel being resurrected, functioning as God's promise to restore Israel back to our homeland. It's a demonstration of God's covenant faithfulness. And I also think it presents one of the clearest descriptions of physical resurrection. In the vision, Ezekiel is brought to a valley that's filled with dry bones. And when Ezekiel repeats the words God commands him to prophesy over these dry bones, this is what happens. There was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breathe, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, 
Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. I think that's an awesome text. And it's hard to get a more descriptive view of physical resurrection. And I think it's fascinating that what Midrash Leviticus Rabbah 27 verse 4, what it says about this passage, and it says this, if someone should say to you, is it possible the Holy One, blessed be he, will resurrect the dead? Say to him, it has already happened. He has already resurrected the dead through Elijah, through Elisha, and through Ezekiel in the Valley of Dura. Our sources tell us that the Jewish concept of resurrection was physical. When the body is resurrected, it is no longer in the grave. So what does the New Testament mean when it says God raised Jesus from the dead? In Acts 23, Paul stands on trial before the Sanhedrin, and this is how he makes his defense. He notices that both Sadducees and Pharisees are present. And it's important to note that Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead, and the Sadducees did not. So, knowing this, Paul addresses the Sanhedrin. In verse 6, he says this, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. So, Paul finds common ground with the Pharisees, because he is a Pharisee, and he appeals to their shared hope in the resurrection of the dead. And after his statement, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, they, they begin to argue with each other. You know, the Pharisees believe in the resurrection, the Sadducees don't, they, they're going back and forth. And what happens is this, the Pharisees end the discussion and they say, we find nothing wrong with this man. What if a spirit or angel has spoken to him? For the Pharisees, there's nothing objectionable claiming that Jesus rose from the dead. They think the dead will be raised, and Paul, a fellow Pharisee, thinks that God raised Jesus from the dead. Jewish New Testament scholar Dr. Isaac Oliver comments on this passage. He says, The author of Acts insinuates that the essential difference existing between the Messianic movement, known as the Way, and the rest of mainstream Judaism only amounts to a failure on the latter to recognize the veracity of the doctrine of the resurrection as manifested through the risen Jesus. And we know that all the gospel reports that Jesus died and left his tomb, he physically rose from the dead. In Acts 2, Peter claims that while David both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day, this Jesus God raised up and of that we are all witnesses. Acts and the gospels record the early Jesus movement's belief that God physically raised Jesus from the dead in the Jewish sense. For Jews, resurrection involved the raising of the physical body. It's not just the survival of the soul. That was a very Greek notion. In fact, in Acts chapter 17, Paul teaches the resurrection of Jesus to the Athenians, and these Greek people begin to scoff. And commenting on this response in Acts chapter 17 verse 32, Jewish scholar Dr. Gary Gilbert says this, The idea of bodily resurrection was contrary to most Greek notions of life after death. So this strongly suggests that there is no true parallel between Jesus' resurrection and any so-called resurrection of a pagan god. For the early Jesus movement, Jesus physically rose from the dead, leaving his tomb behind. And according to Plutarch, the Osiris myth is that he is a dead god and his body remained in a tomb. Biblical scholar Dr. T. N. D. Menninger says this, from the 1930s, a consensus has developed to the effect that the dying and rising gods died but did not return or rise to live again. Those who still think differently are looked upon as residual members of an almost extinct species. I think the reason why most scholars don't see parallels between the fate of the pagan gods like Osiris and Jesus is because physical resurrection was a Jewish belief. We can confidently conclude that there is no legitimate parallel between the death and resurrection of Jesus and the deaths and so-called resurrection of Osiris. Now, what about David's claim that Dionysus had 12 disciples? David did not cite any primary sources to support his claim, so I did some digging. Another Jewish counter-missionary named Asher Norman, he makes this claim in his book, 26 Reasons Why Jews Don't Believe in Jesus. He says that Dionysus was, quote, surrounded by 12 disciples. Norman uses this supposed parallel, among others, to show that much of the accounts of Jesus' life were copied from pagan gods. 
And just like David, he doesn't cite a primary source, but he does cite a book called The Jesus Mysteries by Timothy Freak and Peter Gandy. These authors have a footnote that cites the image of an ancient zodiac from the late Dr. Carl Karenyi's book, Dionysus, Archetypal Image of Indestructible Life. Dionysus, in this book, is not surrounded by 12 disciples. The image depicts being surrounded by 12 signs of the zodiac. And for good reason, Dr. Karenyi does not identify these signs as disciples. Asher Norman claims even more parallels exist between Jesus and the gods such as Baal, Adonis, Addis, Isis, Mithras, Krishna, and Buddha. And if you want an excellent critique of the same claims, I recommend watching Michael Jones' series, Was Jesus a Copycat Savior, on his channel, Inspiring Philosophy. So go subscribe to his channel and check out that video. It's, it's excellent work. And I'll link that in the description below. What I think is strange is that Freak and Gandhi's book, The Jesus Mysteries, is the book that Asher Norman cites to justify all all of his parallels between Jesus and pagan gods, including the claim that Dionysus was surrounded by 12 disciples. And when you see how obviously wrong this claim is, it makes you wonder how much you can trust freaking Gandhi's book for accurate information. I thought it was really interesting what Dr. Bart Ehrman had to say about the parallels freaking Gandhi make. Dr. Ehrman says this, It is not that they have provided an alternative interpretation of the available evidence. They have not even cited the available evidence, and for good reason. No such evidence exists. This is not serious historical scholarship. It is sensationalist writing driven by a desire to sell books. So as we've seen, when we actually look at the primary sources, we see that Osiris' death is nothing like Jesus' death. Osiris did not rise from the dead, and Dionysus did not have 12 disciples. The parallels that David asserted between Jesus, Osiris, and Dionysus do not even exist. On top of this, it is very unlikely that the early Jesus movement would have copied from pagan myths because they, like other first century Jews in general, detested paganism. And this is what I'm going to cover in my next video. If you learned something new, consider giving this video a like and be sure to subscribe so you can get notified when the next video is posted. If you would like to add anything or you disagree with anything I said, I'd love to hear it. So please comment below or you can email us at two messianic Jews at gmail.com. That's two T W O messianic Jews at gmail.com. Thanks for joining me and see you next time.